And before he comes out here, I just want to tell you a couple things about him. He has earned honors from all over the world. He owns restaurants in Chicago, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. He is the author of several cookbooks, and uh, I believe he will be signing after the show, right over in our book signing corner there. And he is a top chef uh, master's contender, an innovator in blending food and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm, rousing welcome to Chef David Burke. Hi. Hello, Chef Burke. Welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right. Hi. Hello. Uh, let me introduce Rick Resch. Uh, Rick is the chef at David Burke Prime House here Hi in there. town. And uh, he's going to help me along the way here. Uh, welcome. This is my 25th year coming to Chicago for this. Um, I had a restaurant in um, Streeterville, for those of you that live in Chicago, in the Double Tree Hotel near the Drake, um, many years ago called Park Avenue Cafe. And I opened Smith & Walensky here, uh, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Now there's David Burke Prime House, which is six years old. Mm -hmm. It's in the James Hotel. It's a dry age, high end, uh, more than a steakhouse, especially with Rick there doing his innovative stuff, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, um, and uh, we're very proud of it, and uh, it's always good to come to Chicago. We're going to start the demo with uh, a dish from our latest restaurant, which is in the James Hotel, New York City, in Soho. It's called David Burke Kitchen. Um, it's been open a little bit over a year. And uh, there's a beautiful garden outside. And that, ta that restaurant is a little bit more farm-to-table driven, uh, a little bit more in, in uh, tune to what's happening in the, uh, with the economy and the trends and what people seem to be uh, uh, desiring. So this is a dish that's uh, made with bone marrow. And it, it's interesting because bone marrow is all of a sudden a, uh, <laughs> it's desirable. And, uh, I mean, chefs, we've always eaten bone marrow. And, Chicken coxcombs and brains and snails, sweetbreads, kidneys. And uh, I got a surprise for you though, later. Though, for, we're going to be eating something very, very different. Um, and, uh, and now it's, you know, pig's ears and all that stuff is fun to eat. I don't know if anybody wakes up yet and says, honey, I'm in the mood for pig ear yet. And I don't know if that's going to come. But it's, it's nice to see that people are eating and trying uh, different things besides... Uh, you know, the wedge and the grilled swordfish and the ribeye. So, so we're going to do this one. And this, this, uh, we designed a really cool menu down there. And uh, we had a dish. We had two dishes that I wanted to put on the menu. One was bone marrow. One was snails. And we didn't have room for both. So I said, to hell with it. We'll put, uh, we'll put them together. The name of the dish is Ants on a Log because after our design of it, and it kind of looked like that. And uh, so we're going to get started. This is the log. Um, it's the bone marrow. And these are from uh, veal. And you got to, you know, obviously your butcher's going to have to cut them. You can cut them crosswise and cut them lengthwise. Sear them in a hot pan or you can grill them. And, uh, you know, snails years ago, you'd find snails on, well, and ch let me get back to Chicago. I'll grill a couple too. You, when I came to Chicago, it was really... Uh, run by French restaurants. The, all the good restaurants for the most part. A lot of them were French. A big, big, strong... Uh, bah, Le Francais leading the way, obviously, and a lot of great French chefs that were here that had restaurants. Uh, and they, we did something called Bocus d'Or here, and, uh, so, and I was judging that. And, uh, um, and so it's now, 25 years later, you see all these young American restaurants and chefs and eating eating what the French were cooking, too, back then, the snails and bone marrow and the sweetbreads and all that stuff. Come a long way. So the, the uh, bone marrow starts cooking. Uh, we're going to roast it. If anyone has any questions, as we go, please ask as we go. We'll keep this thing moving. Rick can answer some of them. Uh, I can answer some of them as I cook. <clears throat> so the bone marrow roasts and, uh, and grills. And I need to try to get this on. Here we go. Snails. Snails. These snails come from a can. So we've braised these already. These are, uh, I guess, Burgundian snails is where most of the snails come from. You can get snails from Oregon that are organic. 
and they're actually fed, uh, they're fed uh, porcini mushrooms and basil. And that's what they live in. That's all they ever really eat. And it sounds funny. But when you eat them, they taste like basil or porcinis. And they're really tiny, very lightly poached. If you're, anybody's from San Francisco, there's, uh, I, I, used to, I did a nice dinner with them years ago up in Calistoga with Jan Birnbaum. And we, uh, we were actually almost eating them live. They were so, so tender. But <clears throat> and they tasted like, like their diet. Rick, you want to set me up a little bit? Yep. This is uh, talk a little bit about the fennel hay. And, uh, so this is just uh, the tops of fennel or fennel fronds. And uh, we use it a lot in the restaurant and oils and dressings and things like that. But we just took this and dehydrated it out so it looks very, very much like you're in the forest floor there. And uh, some croutons. Brush a little bit of olive oil, salt, and pepper. Just kind of throw those off to one side. Wow. There you go. Um, so a lot of, like, the fennel tops will smoke chicken in this hay. Oh, in restaurants, uh, which I'm sure most of you know, we don't, we try not to throw anything away. So the tops, uh, we, use this, we use this as a hay. We'll torch it. We'll finish off our chickens. If we pan roasting a chicken, we'll throw this in and burn it, put a lid on it, and let it roast, finish in the oven. We do it with regular hay. We do it this. We do it with rosemary stems and thyme and such. So back to the snails. I've got some fennel, garlic, a little bit of roast garlic, a couple cloves, um, and some fennel seed, a little orange zest, and we're just going to saute that a bit. The bone marrow is caramelized. And now the idea here is just to get a lot of salt on that. It almost becomes a crust in there. And these are going to take a little longer because the grill's not hot. So, <clears throat> so. <clears throat> Rick made a ramp pesto today, so we're going to use that. Uh, classic snails, burgundy, you know, garlic has fennel in it and lots of garlic parsley. Um, escargot butter, so we're sticking to that theme somewhat. So here's the snails, the garlic, the fennel, the orange, a little bit of cold stock. We'll reduce that down a touch. I'm going to take a little bit of this off. Um. <clears throat> butter, always butter. Butter's good. So the bone marrow, normally I'd cook a little bit more, but... Being that we're, we've got five dishes to cover, we're going to move it along. <clears throat> you got tongs in the water, Chef. So we're making a little pan sauce here. Snails, butter, don't forget your salt and pepper. Another log. And it's amazing how many of these we sell now. You know, you take two items. I, I think people that eat bone marrow eat snails, so... One of the things, uh, a little bone marrow fat, we don't th we'll throw into the sauce. There's that ramp pesto. <clears throat> and there you go. Ants on a log. Smells great. The garlic, the fennel seed. You got orange in here too. Orange zest. One more. Up. Oh. Uh, serve this with an espresso spoon, cocktail fork, toast. And that's something that you would see at uh, David Burke Kitchen, which is our more rustic uh, restaurant at the James in New York. And then we're going to scramble some eggs. We have our logo. Uh, when I was a chef at the River Cafe uh, in from 85 to 92 in Brooklyn, if you have not been there and you go to New York and you... Uh, have more than one night, because the first night you're going to go to my place. The second night, go to the river. 
Um, it's a really wonderful restaurant underneath the base of the Brooklyn Bridge with stunning views of Manhattan. And uh, a lot of good chefs have come out of there. Larry Forgione, who's the father of Mark Forgione. Larry, Charlie Palmer from Oriole. And on and on and on. Um, eggs. Uh, so there, I started messing with eggs at the River Cafe. We did a lot of things with eggs, and I don't know why, but we got known as the Egg Man and uh, sea urchins, things in shells. And one of the hors d'oeuvres we did was a, uh, a sea urchin uh, flan. So we're gonna make somewhat of a scrambled egg. One of the things we do with scrambled eggs that are different, if we're making, this is gonna be lobster scrambled eggs. So we put lobster bisque in the egg, cold egg, instead of milk or tomato soup in the cold egg or mushroom soup, whatever we're gonna be carrying with that dish, if we're gonna do a mushroom scramble, we flavor the eggs with that flavor. Uh, in this case, um, a little bit of lobster reduction. Lots of sherbet. And some butter. Get some uh, garlic quick. So I got butter. We got a little bit of lobster that we poached earlier. And this dish works for us for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. One of those dishes. A little touch of garlic. So and again, the, the, we want to brown the lobster meat. When you brown a caramelized lobster meat, it, it takes on a nutty flavor. It's pretty good. That's what we'll do with our next dish also. Uh, I have some sun-dried tomatoes. I'll throw that in. And we got a little lemon zest somewhere. Yeah. I got it. Got it. I got it done. Oh, there you go. That's easy. Lemon. Now we got a brown uh, lobster. This is the eggs with the lobster base in them. So I'm whipping the eggs just to get some more air into them and create a, light, a lighter scramble. Could have used a little bit of a bigger pan. That would have saved me a little time. But save, uh, now the French eat their eggs a little runny like this. And we always uh, we try to keep them a little bit softer. Because they do carry over. Scrambled eggs with lobster. Uh, what I have here is an ostrich egg. Sometimes we use ostrich eggs. This is an ostrich egg cut in half. Now you can use it, you can buy these, believe it or not, at ostrich.com. They're $20. They were $15 each a couple years ago when I started. Now they're 30. That's the way it goes. So, scrambled eggs. Creme fraiche. A little caviar. And these are the, um, the whiskers that we use as garnish. These are lobster. We're very frugal. Um, so this is a dish you'd get at David Burke. Uh, David Burke Townhouse, which was once called David Burke and Donatella. And that is on 61st Street in New York City, between Park and Lexington. A little fancier. That's probably the fanciest of our restaurants. Um, and it's the first, and a flagship. It's the first one I opened. That, and that's about eight years old now. And those are, that's a signature type dish that, uh, that we, we serve for uh, lunch and dinner, brunch. It's caviar without caviar. <clears throat> the next dish uh, is, uh, well, Monster. I'm going to put these in the oven. This is biscuits. This is a basic biscuit dough. 
uh, and we've we made seaweed. We put a little seaweed into them. We we also wrapped them like soap on a rope, like seaweed. They were uh, it's a basic yeast bread or a Parker House. And uh, I just throw a little little bit of egg on there. And this is great to garnish soup with. Serve with tartare. We're going to serve this with the angry lobster. I don't know if the oven on. Yep. Any questions? While we're moving through scrambled eggs and ants on a lot. Next dish is angry lobster. Take a look at the bone marrow. You see how it's bubbling out so you get starting to souffle even. That's good stuff. Now this bone marrow for that of summer is come. Try it on a grill and barbecue it. A barbecue, you know, a barbecue sauce with a little horseradish on it. Good stuff. Chef Burke, we have yes. a question right over here. Yes, sir. Hello, Chef. Uh, can I try the ants on the log, please? Yes, you can. <laughs> that was a good question. <laughs> Smart man. Yeah. <laughs> There's 10 ants. Here you go. Right there. Okay, so uh, Angry Lobster. This is a dish that uh, a friend of mine started making called Lobster Arabiata at a little Italian place down in Tribeca. And... Uh, <laughs> And I, it was made as a main course. I kind of took it and went my own way with it. You're welcome. And it's uh, made it an appetizer. Did it more in a Chinese style of cooking where you take a... Uh, you take the lobster. And we cut it live. We obviously took the whiskers off of that other dish. But we cut it... Uh, we hack it up with a cleaver. Or we use a bandsaw. So the meat is raw, but it's cut up. Um, and we sear it. And when you do that, you get a great flavor. When you boil lobster, you cook all the juice away. It gets steamed away or boiled away, and a lot of the flavor goes into the water. You drain the pan off, and you've got a nice texture of lobster with a, with a hint of flavor. But most of the flavor is gone. The way we cook this way, this is lobster oil made from the shell. So we, 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 we keep reinforcing, reinforcing the fact that we want it to taste like lobster. Um, we got a life. So I'm going to make a couple smaller pieces here. So we, we're going to sear it off. This is flour, which we call angry flour. It's just a nickname in the kitchen. So that we don't confuse it with the other flour. So we're, we're almost cooking this like a, like a veal cutlet or a chicken cutlet flour. It's got spices in it. Cayenne pepper is one of them. Chili powder is another. So that's part of where the angry is coming in. So I just get the... Uh, you get the uh, idea here. You just... So I tell you now, we're very busy in the restaurant. We'll sell, we'll sell like 30 to 5 of these a night. So it's, this is a one man, this is what one guy does. He works the angry station. So you can imagine what, when he gets home at night and somebody asks him, how was your night? He's angry. Because it's a tough position because you got to use your hands and it gets awfully hot. So this, this is... Uh, this is caramelizing. Again, caramelized lobster. Lobster, everybody says, is sweet. Lobster is sweeter when it's brown, just like a steak. Whenever you caramelize something, you develop the sugars and the protein, and you get a sweeter product. In the case of lobster, it really, really shows. And it's a different flavor than you're familiar with, uh, if you haven't done it, because most of us don't... Uh, we don't uh, eat sautéed lobster. We eat it boiled. We have another question, Chef Bird. Another question, please. Yes, sir. Chef, how do you feel about American caviar? Pardon me? How do I feel about American caviar? That's a good question. I, I like it. There's some pretty good stuff. I actually tasted some uh, two days ago in New York, and I tasted some at our chef's meeting two weeks ago. So it's good stuff coming out of California. Um, really pretty, really good stuff. Good price, too. 40 bucks an ounce or something. I don't remember the name, but we started putting it on our menus uh, in New York last week. Really, really nice. <clears throat> and 
And there was an Israeli caviar I tasted two days ago. Uh, it was pretty good. A little bit more, a little, I think, $80, $90 an ounce for my cost. Um, and then there was another one was high rent, but I, I didn't have, uh, my patience wore out in that meeting. I had to leave. But um, the caviar we use for things like this and that, the American stuff is very good. There's some stuff I got from Tennessee recently, too. Uh, Franklin, Tennessee. Paddlefish caviar that I didn't taste yet, but it looked good. And some smoked catfish they sent me, um, but I haven't had a chance to taste that. So our lobster, believe it or not, is done. Because all we need to do is warm it up. And then, just similar to bone marrow, I cook the protein side, and then I'm going to, the back shell is going to warm through and finish cooking, uh, finish. Look, look, look at this, uh, if you can see this, you see this lobster claw? You see, it's like an egg white. The protein that came out of that, it looks just like an egg white. And it cooks at the same temp. 140 on that. So, you, you know, this can go a little slower, but... But um, I'm going to pass it over to Rick. He's going to plate it. We have another question. Jeff another question. Clark. It's actually a follow-up question. Can you have another bite? Yes. Can I have some of the uh, lobster and eggs, please? Go ahead. Help yourself. Oh, boy. And give him, you know what? Give him some crouton. Are you hungry, sir? Come some. Uh... Okay, so we got the... Uh... Hi. You can help yourself. I don't think we're allowed to get you all up here. Otherwise, I would have fed you. All but right, you can help a, yourself. Here. Here he's going to have a taste right here. How's it taste, sir? Thank you. Yeah, give us some feedback. All right, you're going to... Uh, so on the, on the angry, this is uh, another part of the angry. This is, a, this is nails. This is what a florist used called a frog. Uh, we used to put tulips and uh, things like that. So we had a hard time presenting this, so it looked neat. So we, we, uh, we added the, the frog... And then we, we garnish it with some lemons because the lemons are needed for beauty and flavor. We're going to get some feedback over here, and Chef uh, Burke. Yes. How's that taste, sir? Uh, some of the finest chefs uh, come from New Jersey and uh, <laughs> the Hazlitt area in particular. Are you from Hazlitt? Uh, no, I've dated a girl from Hazlitt, but you and I have met before at the Fromagerie. Oh, that's nice. Great. You know, it's true that there's uh, a lot of good chefs from Jersey. Uh, in fact... There's a book out. The best chefs in Boston are all from Jersey. <laughs> it's funny, Dad. <laughs> I, don't, I don't make that up. It's like Ken Oranger and Michael Schlau and uh, I mean, there's many good chefs in Boston. And uh, Jasper White. Jasper White went to high school with Springsteen. And um, he just got a great award by the CIA. So anyway, Angry Lobster. So we're kind of... Uh, Putting this together, this is an appetizer for $25. Um, okay. We build it this way, but the hard part <laughs> is you got to use your hands and it's hot. So when you work that station, it's uh So you called it the Angry Lobster? It's called the Angry Lobster. Love it. And uh, this is, uh, we need to get this in and out of the kitchen in five minutes and every one is cooked to order. Okay, so, oh, oh I forgot. Got to make the sauce. So the sauce is, I burned it. Let me show. Talking about Jasper White. Here we go. So I, I burned the oil. So the drippings uh, are going here. I'll add a little more. So it's lobster oil for the sauce. Garlic and ginger. Ginger is optional. Uh, little red pepper flakes. Garlic. Herbs. Um, basil, lots of basil leaves. This is lemon juice. So, so you've got lobster oil, lemon. Uh, you can't go wrong. It's lemon, zest, ginger, garlic, basil, butter. So that basil's cooking into the oil. There's a little fried basil brick put on top there. And there is that uh, red pepper flakes and the heat from the ginger and garlic. I add a little salt. And there's a little bit of heat. Uh, and that's a, this is uh, 
It's not a Weight Watcher dish. So that's Angry Lobster. This is uh, one of the dishes that's on several of our menus. Fishtail in the, on 62nd Street. And we have a restaurant that the gentleman mentioned um, called David Burke from Andre, which is where I started cooking. In, uh, it's in Monmouth County, New Jersey. And uh, that's where I grew up near there. And we've, uh, it's actually our sixth anniversary yesterday of buying that place. And if you're down in the, it's not the Jersey Shore you see on TV. <laughs> it's a nice, it's a pretty nice area. It's uh, commuting distance to Manhattan and uh, quite nice. Next dish is that weird dish I told you about. And that weird dish is uh, why I order. It's kind of like Jackie Gleason said, why I order. Because it's a aorta. This is a beef heart aorta. Big heart, huh? So it's cooked. This is the tube, the main tube. So when you hear about your clogged aorta, you got problems. Um, I was in a slaughterhouse here about what, about a year ago, right? Where yeah. I went to what's the name of that place? Oh Christ, I, don't I went to a slaughterhouse. We own a bull. We're in the beef business somewhat. We got a patent on dry aging meat. We'll get to that with the next course. I was at a slaughterhouse uh, up north here, northwest. Yeah. What's the name of that town? There's a town name there. Whatever it was. I'll think about it. I was in the slaughterhouse, you know, they're processing. And on the floor is a, about 300 of these aortas. And to me, it looked like calamari. I'm like, it looks like calamari tubes because they're white. These are brown because I cooked them in beef stock. Um, <clears throat> and the guy, you know, they aortas. And I'm like, aorta. And, and da, 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 da. Anyway, it looked like calamari to me. So we cooked them. We braised them and beef stock with horseradish and tarragon and tarragon vinegar, things that you put in a Bernays sauce. And uh, we cut them into rings that look like calamari. And believe it or not, we fry them and they are delicious. So we call them calamari and they will be at a theater near you. And they're very inexpensive. In fact, they're free right now. But in about two years, <laughs> they're gonna be five bucks a pound. Uh, so we're gonna make a quick tempura flour, a little cornstarch. So the idea here is, a, is to take something like an aorta, uh, and the reason people often ask, how did you come up with that idea, and da, 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 but you gotta be in that place. You gotta go to these places and, and expose yourself to uh, the product. You have to find it, and uh, that's what happens when you go to a slaughterhouse. You find weird things, or you walk the streets of Vietnam, or you're, or you're uh, you just put, you know, you play with your food a little bit. Uh, I need water. So uh, tempura is normally flour and water. You can use different flours. Some people use club soda. We're going to add a little bit of beef stock. Just to, again, we want to we wanna use something that's going to make that thing that normally tastes pretty gross into something that tastes pretty good because it's very irony, as you can imagine. And, uh, but again, now we live in a day and age where we can, people will try anything once. And uh, so this dish, even though we, we uh, kind of uh, sat around working on a name, right, Rick? What was the first name? We had a different name. Beef rings. Or Beef I don't rings, know. yeah. So calamari works because now you can relate to it. But we haven't yet put it on. I was in Australia, I don't know, a month ago, <coughs> cooking for 400 people. And that was the first time I made it. Rick made it once or twice. And... Uh, Came out pretty good. And I was like, I better, might as well experiment <laughs> in Australia before I do the demo. <laughs> and the guy, guy asked me, he goes, you ever make this before? Because I kept saying, well, try this, cook it longer. I said, no, I haven't. But thanks, <laughs> thanks for letting me use your kitchen and your clientele. <laughs> and it was a great, I did it in two, Sydney one night and Melbourne the next night. And uh, so I have a, tempura with a oh, horseradish. I'm adding horseradish and some nice herbs. And I want to take some uh, uh, some of this. Some chopped herb. Okay, so that's, uh, we broke every rule in making tempura. Not supposed to use a whisk. <laughs> supposed to use bubbly water. No herbs. We, the hell, I don't know what it is. All right. Um, flour. Any angry flour left? So, so you see what we did here. This is the, the, the this is the aorta. 
This has been cooked for three hours, right, Ray? Four. Uh, Brace for about six, six, seven hours. And then we uh, sous vide the other rings for about another eight. Yeah, so it's a long process. So you, it's not something you whip up on the fly. Um, you, 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 you make it, you braise it, but it's really a, uh, it, it's going to be a bar snack and it's a cool, uh, I think, I like it. It's, it's not like the guy down the block sells it either. So we're always looking for an angle. This is a nice bar snack for us. It garnishes a filet mignon. It can garnish a piece of fish. This would be good pickled. I like it fried because fried is, uh, reminds me of a, a fried a spider up top too. Okay. <clears throat> so, all right, now. Now you're going to have to come up and taste this. Right? <laughs> so. Okay. Does anybody have another question for Chef Burke? Anybody want to talk about beef heart? Okay, so I'm going to cook these, and then we're going to get moving on to uh, talking about beef and our aging process and our famous uh, salt tile room that we have in Chicago and, and also uh, in New York now. We do have another question, Chef Burke. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I'm, all from, I'm from New Jersey, too, right over here. Oh, yeah. Hoboken. Hoboken. Yeah. I uh, met a guy from Isla Restaurant. You ever been there? He's here, I think. Chef from Isla Restaurant here in Hoboken? I told me he was coming. I saw him in the airport. Hoboken, I live in Fort Lee. I'm not far. So I'm curious, uh, um, how, what inspires you to come up with some of the recipes that you're coming up with? You mentioned that you were in a slaughterhouse. You're kind of in that environment to create things. Pardon? You were in an environment. I'm, I'm curious about what inspires you to create new things, completely new things. Uh, uh, you mentioned. I mean, utilization for this, this particular dish, it would be to utilize something that is otherwise being shipped to a foreign country or being thrown, made into a different type of food, pâtés, bologna, whatever, uh, and to be able to educate our cooks and, and, that, and come up with something that might be an item that we sell. You know, sometimes we find a, uh, a bed of nails and might say, you know, what would look good on this? A crudité, a functional uh, design elements, sometimes it's seasonality, sometimes it's just desire to make something cool with something you like, like black sea bass or... or uh, uh, crab, uh, uh, Dungeness crab or stuff like that. You know, sometimes I'll just buy food and have it delivered to my restaurant and, and, and create with it. Something like this is a little off the wall because there's, no, uh, there's no recipe for this. So you got to relate it to another recipe like we did and create something else. So, so you've got um, a little, a little calamari, calamari. So now you have little calamari rings, see? Similar to calamari rings. And our homemade paper towel cone. There you go. So that's uh, $25. No. <laughs> But, you know, that, that will eventually morph into something that becomes, it might be a Thai style. That'll morph into something that, uh, because it's good, and it's fun, and it's interesting, and it's something you haven't had before. That'll turn into a dish that becomes something we use often as a bar snack, a brunch item, or any, uh, but again, we have to figure out how to cook it quicker, make it more de de delicious and delectable, and uh, be able to uh, source it easily. I mean, most of them get shipped uh, to foreign countries for what, for the people that like to eat in uh, food innards, and uh, we, we're not that country. So, has anyone ever made buffet order out here? Say, there you go. I got something to talk about later. <laughs> later. But I like it, and uh, the tempura should have been a little bit thinner for my taste. All right, next is uh, beef. Beef is. Uh, I started my career in fancy French restaurants, worked in France, competed in uh, French competitions. And then I, uh, I left the River Cafe. I opened the Park Avenue Cafe in New York City. Still there. It's in the neighborhood that my other two restaurants are in. And the owner of Park Avenue Cafe, who was my partner, owned Smith & Walensky. And he had created uh, TGI Fridays in the 60s. And then he created uh, Smith & Walensky in the 70s. And uh, we opened Park Avenue Cafe, which was really pretty much in style as to what people are cooking now. It's a really, a more, really kind of designed after what Union Square Cafe was. Uh, more casual, uh, 
A lot of American wines, better service, not, you know, no suits and tuxedos. Getting away from um, what, uh, what we knew as fancier service. And, uh, but the food was very, was very American, very creative. Uh, somewhat, a little bit what you would, a little overworked for maybe today. We started a little simpler. The clientele on Upper Park Ave demanded a little bit more. And we gave it to them. Homemade breads. Um, beautiful pastries. Um, and things like that. So that was Park Ave Cafe. But he opened, uh, we opened Smith & Wesley. So he asked me to open some steakhouses with him. And uh, we opened the first one called Maloney and Porcelli in Manhattan. And it's still around. They just did a redo on that. And we created there something called uh, the Swordfish Chop. Uh, the crackling pork shank, and the pork shank went on to be best dish in America by USA Today. It's still on the menus. In fact, it was really the beginning of putting pork on fancy menus. Like pork is the center of the plate that wasn't a pork chop or filet uh, pork uh, loin, which you had this fatty, rustic, it was very Munich or uh, Bavarian style pork shank. Yeah, but we cooked it French technique, confit, crispy, fried, beautiful dish. We sell it uh, as specials in our restaurants. Um, so that got me into the steakhouse business, and we learned how to age correctly. And uh, we, you know, I finally came out. We opened a restaurant, David Burke Prime, Prime House by David Burke here. And we have another one in Connecticut at Foxwoods Casino. Uh, soon to have one in New York City. And... Uh, what happened through that process well, before we opened here is we, we designed an aging box. We knew that aging beef would be our strength. Um, we wanted to have the, a, as good a steak as Peter Luger's. So we set out to do that. And, and in doing that, we sourced the best beef. We, we bought a bull in Kentucky for $20,000. $250,000. And he was uh, 2,500 pounds. His name was Prime. And uh, so that was a big story. We bought a big bull. We bought a stud, you know. <laughs> Always wanted to be one, we had to buy one. So, <laughs> so, so <laughs> it was, I mean, the thing was huge. <laughs> huge. And I'm in the pen with him, you know, I'm a city guy. So I went down there to meet him and to, you know, like, don't look good, give it to us in the mouth kind of thing. And, uh, and I wore a red shirt. And I'm in the pen with him. <laughs> and he's getting irritated and they're snapping pictures and I'm, and the guys, you know, why would, you know, the red thing, you know, you don't wear reds. So anyway, we were friends after that, anyway. So he passed away, uh, but his, uh, in thoroughbreds, like thoroughbred horses, he helped give us all the great beef we need uh, through insemination. So we had basically a partnership with the Creekstone Farms, which is the best beef facility probably in the U.S. right now. They, they, they grade out a lot of prime. Then we decided how we're going to dry age correctly, and we came upon this stuff, which is Himalayan salt, and we started to, uh, my idea was to uh, age the beef with salt lining the walls of the refrigerator, and that's what happened. And Rick, you can, I'm going to start cooking, and you can uh, talk more about the salt. So the beef here, when you look, look at the beef, this is a ribeye. There's, there's lots of fat here. This doesn't really count, but it's the marble that you want. It's that little streaks. So that's where the flavor is. And when you dry age, the meat, um, a couple things happen in the meat. I'm going to start to cook the meat and cut some fries, and Rick can talk more about the salt and the patent and all that other good stuff. So the, uh, the dry aging box is in the basement of the hotel, and we have about 250 of these blocks that line the wall. Uh, the temperature of the room is between 34 and 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and we hold it at uh, 60 to 70 percent humidity. Uh, the rest of our walk-in refrigerators are closer to 90 percent uh, humidity. We have uh, four fans in there that are blowing in multi-direction. It's really, compared to a normal walk-in, quite a violent like air force moving around in there. Uh, and so we get wet aged meat, technically, which comes in uh, once a week. Take it out of the plastic. It's all weighted and tagged for the date and the weight when we arrived it. And, uh, and we wait for about a month before we even touch it. Uh, it's just sitting on some racks with lots of room around it so the air can get to it. And uh, the first uh, 30 days, uh, we lose 20% by weight. And then we have another 15 to 20% of trim loss on the outside. The longer we age it, the more we lose. So we dry age 28, 40, 55 days, which is what's on the grill here, and 75 days. 
Uh, each one has its own unique flavor and, and, and also tenderness profile. So it's really about finding the right steak for your palate. Uh, the, the longer it ages, the more intense the, the kind of beef flavor to almost gamey flavor, blue cheesy kind of flavor um, gets to it. And then, as Chef was saying, we, we don't throw anything out, so this is what we call beef love. All those trimmings we render out and uh, some people might brush butter or uh, olive oil or something like that onto the steaks. We actually put more dried beef fat back into the steaks. Uh, this is great for scrambled eggs. Uh, vinaigrettes, dressings, things like that. A little bit goes a long way. Um, in that aging box now, since we have it, we do all our own prosciuttos, uh, copa, salamis, things like that. Uh, my latest crazy thing is I got a bunch of used bourbon barrels. And uh, back in the day, um, there's the Boston butt, which used to, is the pork shoulder basically. And it's called Boston butt because the butts were the barrel and they would be shipped across to other parts of the country. There's also a Montreal butt and a Quebec butt. And those kind of fell out of fashion with plastic and, and nobody really thinks about it anymore, but that wood actually flavored the pork a little bit. So I cut the face off the barrels and we're uh, aging some meat. I have duck breast on the menu right now that's been in the barrel for about 10 to 14 days. We have uh, two ribeyes in one of the barrels that uh, go for 30 days and then we take it out and dry age it for another two weeks. So it actually perfumes the meat. Uh, we have uh, a bunch of different cheeses. Brie, we take a common brie cheese, and it, uh, you know, $2 a pound type brie cheese, and it tastes like $15 a pound cheese by the time you're done with it. And then uh, I have iced tea in one of the barrels. So we're constantly pushing uh, the aging process with whatever we can do. Back to you. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the origin of this, in 05, I came out with a product called Flavor Sprays. And they were fat-free, cow-free, carb-free, diabetic-friendly flavored sprays, bacon, butter, blue cheese. Uh, we had all kinds of flavors. And, we, and they'll be back in about six months um, to spray on food, to add flavor, healthy. So I went to the food science lab, and I wanted to uh, invent dry-age flavor, the flavor that gets developed in a beef after many days in this cool temperature. Like, like a fresh cheese versus a dry parm. It gets more intense in flavor. Umami is created, et cetera, et cetera. So I brought, the, I brought a big prime rib in that was somewhat rotten and sent it to the lab. And about four months later, the scientist came to me and he told me that the number one flavor in dry aged beef was cardboard. Cardboard was what that tasted like. Because the old fashioned dry aged box have cardboard on the floor to, to sop up the, the fat that drips in the blood and and so you don't slip when you move and carry these boxes. So the, the idea that cardboard permeated the meat led me to the salt permeating the meat and also preserving the rotting, rotting time or the aging time. So we, can, we have meat in the box since the day we opened that is not rotten. It's, it's petrified, but there's no, it's not rotten. So the idea is that it's, it gives us a longer shelf life, slows down the bacteria growth, but still gives us a dry age flavor and slows down the shrinkage to a certain degree uh, for our stuff. So we got a patent on that technique about four months ago, which we're very proud of, and uh, so it worked. We did a lot of tasting and blind tests and all that good stuff. Not only is it beautiful, and we make bars and walls out of it, but in the, in the refrigerator, um, it is working wonders. If, actually, if you put one of these in your fridge at home, you don't have to ever have to buy Arm & Hammer again. This will do the same thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Kills odors, purifies the air somewhat. So there's, uh, that's, uh, that's what baking soda is really doing for you there. I didn't want to give you that away because I'm going to sell that. Uh, anyway, French fries. Everybody likes steak and fries. This is a beef, a potato, sorry. That is blanched. If you never know French fries, you blanch them. We have a ring mold here. And this is another one of those jobs we give to the guy who shows up late. So you get the idea. <laughs> you roll them around, you stick them in, it comes out like this, you throw that right in there. My son made me think of that because he was, there was a McDonald's commercial on, it's got to be 20, 18 years ago, and he asked me why my fries were never perfectly straight in the container. 
And uh, I lived across the street at the River Cafe at the time, so we walked over there and we did it. And, uh, oh, it's hot. See that? I'm not used to this. <laughs> Woo. So you fry it right in the ring, and then you let it set, and then it slips out like that. There's another one here. Come on. And the, the success rate of this is... It's like palm souffles for those who used to make palm souffle. Yeah, some work, some don't. You know, you have a good day, you have a bad day, but, you know. So, uh, That's gonna and pop. there's a little salad. So, again, this salad, we make, we serve a Caesar salad with dry-aged beef. Just like, like, a, like pizza. When people eat pizza, they love pizza. Because you got a lot of umami going on a pizza with tomatoes and parmesan and yeast. And the same thing comes with steak and Caesar dressing with the anchovies and the parmesan. So that seems to be uh, uh, working for us from a flavor profile. So steaks are, uh, we like to caramelize them a little more than that, but I don't want to kill these. And uh, so the, the salad goes in. Oh, go with this one. Out. Rick, you out. <laughs> so Rick went through the love. The love marinade is here. This is rendered beef fat with a little bit of... Uh, Mustard powder and, um, you know, a little bit of pepper. A little bit of a... Tap. There you go. How you guys liking the show? The trade show? Good. I believe we have another question right over here, Chef Burke. Chef, with the All whole the questions uh, are right here. You guys are on a tour. <laughs> How you doing? I'm <laughs> doing well. With uh, the whole farm to table thing going on, can you speak to uh, uh, grass fed beef a little bit? You want to hear about farm to table? Uh, grass fed beef. Uh, oh, grass fed beef. Yeah. Good question. Um, we use corn fed beef, but grass fed beef, um, a lot of people are hedging toward grass fed beef now. It's better for the. It's eco friendly. It's better for this, it's better for that. Argentinian beef is very tasty, it's grass-fed. Uh, it's a different type of beef, but uh, our beef is an all-natural product that gets fed all-natural grain or corn at the end. And so it's a, to me, it's a better beef. I, I prefer this. Grass-fed beef is very good for you, maybe. Um, they say it's a little healthier for you. So is turkey bacon, right? <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I like this kind of beef, <laughs> I do. and I'm going to continue to eat this kind of beef. But I think it's important to make sure the animal, and one of the reasons we went, uh, we went to Creekstone is I went to the slaughterhouse. There's a, there's a show out there, I forget the name of the show, a girl named Temple Grandin who uh, designed the slaughterhouse, and they did a movie about her, making it as humane as possible for the animals. Really good movie or document, I think it was a movie. And uh, she designed this slaughterhouse. These animals are kept in, you know, really done well. It's about as good as it gets. It's a smaller farm. So we chose to do that because when I was with Smith and Walensky, or opening steakhouses, there was a mad cow scare. And I said to myself, a mad cow in America would really turn it, you know, forget the burger joints, but the big steakhouses. So we, we, we ensure that our beef, no matter what happens, we know where it's coming from. We, we know the farmer. You know, we know the deal. Uh, I still, you know, it's, it's about as good as it gets. There's no hormones, there's, no, uh, there's nothing in the feed. The, the animals grow, they're treated well. It's about as good as I can get on that. We also have a, uh, a sustainable seafood restaurant in Manhattan called Fishtail. And the problem with that is, uh, you, you know, we, we pay the extra price for all the sustainable food and we don't get it on the other end. So it's, you know, always the, the whole, uh, <laughs> the organic movement and sustainability always seem to, coincide with bad economies. So, you know, it's, you know, you want to raise prices, which we can't. Uh, so we're about 80% sustainable uh, in, in fishtail uh, because at the beginning, we had 100%, we just couldn't pay, to, we couldn't do it. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of people asking for it. And nor were the writers really trumping the fact that we were that sustainable. So it's one of those balancing acts. You got to be in business and calamari, uh, monkfish, certain skate, you couldn't put that on a menu because it was so people were looking for that. So we're, we're at about 75-80% in that aspect. But as far as uh, grass-fed beef, uh, we don't age grass-fed beef. Grass-fed beef tastes good. It's a different beef. It's a little more irony, bloodier tasting. Uh, this is a little sweeter. 
fatter. This is, uh, this is a luxurious piece of meat. Dry, when you dry age a prime piece of beef the way we do, it's very hard to beat it. We're buying the best, we're, we're raising the best, and we're aging it with a technique that has been recognized by the U.S. government as a patented process. So we think we got the best beef in America. And uh, so we're going to stick with that and leave the grass for someone else. The grass is always greener on the other side. But that was a good question. Thank you. Um, so we got a ribeye here with a Charlotte. That's a, you know, we, we, you wouldn't get the French fry thing at the prime house because it's just too much work. But it's for those of chefs that are here, that it's just an interesting concept of frying things like that. Uh, but our steakhouses and our menu at prime house is uh, much more advanced than a normal steakhouse as far as culinary style, farm to table. Rick's making cheese and bourbon. And every time I come back to town, I got a, there's a new science project uh, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty I did, much. And if you're coming to dinner, take a look at our cave where we age the meat. Like, I walk down there, there's uh, barrels of cheese and ducks, and I am. Um, people are asking me, I, I don't know what that is. We also age our own burgers. We're going to make our own jerky. So, you know, we have a lot. There's a lot to do when you take upon a project like that. And the, the, one of the uh, constraints for chefs years ago is you couldn't sell lots of things. Now, you know, it's people are trying... A lot of different things. So we're like the whole farm, nose to tail and all that. We, so it's good for guys like us to, to be able to play that way. Chef Burke, can you tell us a little bit about the ice cream pop-up shop that you're going to open? The pros and cons of opening a pop-up shop. Rick, it's Rick's idea. They do it here. We did it yesterday. Great stuff. Rick can redress that. It's a fun little thing. My pastry chef, Jove, is really talented and loves making like crazy ice cream flavors. And it started off with uh, we were hungry in the kitchen one day. And uh, he was whipping up some crazy stuff. And uh, we looked at the summertime and how do we get people in the neighborhood to come over and, and kind of have that afternoon break. So it's for every Friday afternoon from 3 to 5. Uh, we have two different flavors that we offer. We announced the flavors on social media on Wednesday. And it's 5 bucks. And cup or cone. And we're out there scooping ice cream. And every week we probably have about 200 people or so. And it's a little goofy cult following. Uh, we actually run contests for people to give us flavor ideas. Um, and we get to chat with everybody that comes up to the window. It's actually my pastry chef and I collecting money old school style. What are some of the wackier flavors you guys have come up with or your, your Facebook readers? We've done everything from uh, coffee and donuts to, uh, we did yesterday, Margarita Grande. So it was actually a, a Cointreau ice cream with a tequila swirl. And a, uh, uh, and a Kentucky, Kentucky Derby. Derby was the secret flavor yesterday, which was a uh, bourbon ice cream with uh, white chocolate and walnut uh, Kentucky Derby pie folded in. Um, the sky's the limit. I mean, we really do some crazy stuff. And is this something you plan on continuing, or is this just kind of a seasonal? Well, we only do it in the summertime just because of the, you know, it's a little cold for ice cream in Chicago <laughs> in, in January. But uh, we started yesterday, and we run all the way through the summer until probably, you know, mid-September, depending how the weather goes. Does anybody have any other questions for Chef Burke or Rick? All righty, right back here. Thank you. Yes, sir, your question is. Yes, uh, going back to the beef, have you ever done anything with Kobe beef that's supposed to be a high-end type of beef? Yep, Kobe beef is, uh, Kobe beef's interesting. It's very fancy, it's very fatty, it's very luxurious and delicious and very expensive. Um, we sell Kobe beef sometimes. Our beef is so good that we don't need to use Kobe. I mean, our beef is as, as rich as we want it already. So yeah, one of the, when you see a Kobe burger on the menu, for example, and they charge you more money for it, the burger can only be so fatty before it's just not good. So a Kobe burger, to me, if it's true Kobe and it's ground up, it would, if you started with eight ounces, you'd went, wind up with four because the fat would just melt out. So we would never, I would never serve a Kobe burger. Um, because if I have good meat like this that's AIDS, I don't need to buy Kobe meat for that. But Kobe beef is a real treat if you get the real stuff. We have another question right here, Chef Burke. If uh, using salt has been a historic way of preserving things, how did this get to be patented? And have you ever tried sugar as a preservative? Um, salt has been used as a preservative for, for centuries. In fact, the word salt, salary comes from salt. That's how they paid you. you if you had salt, you could keep your kill. Through the winter, you, you preserve ducks, you preserve the uh, grave locks means grave and locks, buried salmon. So salt was a way of preserving duck confit and uh, those, those type of things. So salt was always used in meats, prosciuttos. <clears throat> There's also, uh, 
if you go to Scotland or, and, uh, and, and uh, Normandy and such, the lamb graze on the cliffs of the ocean, and they're called pre sale lamb. They eat grass that's salty because of the air, and they breathe in salty air. So that's, this is as close as pre sale beef because it's pre-salted in the process of aging. So even if I cook this beef with no salt and pepper next to another piece that was aged in a different box, you'd, you'd pick this beef. Did they, uh, second part of your question? Sugar. Yeah, sugar. And how did this get to be patented if it's always been used historically? Salt. Salt has never been used for dry aging beef. It's been used for preservation. This is the dry aging technique. Uh, we, we're, not trying to, we're not trying to preserve the beef, we're trying to enhance its flavor and, and extend its shelf life. And there's also a technique of rotating the beef through the system of uh, in and out. And, and tagging and weighting them. So the salt itself has been around before anything was around. That's a primordial ocean salt from the Himalayas. Preserving in sugar, I have not done 100%, but that's more like marmalading and confiteurs and stuff like that. I think you need the salt to pull out any bacteria before you add sugar as a preservative <coughs> in, in proteins. And the beef actually never, in the aging box, never touches the salt. It's just yeah, the, in the air. Before we go, Chef Burke, can you tell us about the beautiful little tree that just grew on stage? Oh, the one Starbucks sent over? <laughs> this is, these are my lolly cheesecake pops that, uh, that we serve in all of our restaurants. As, uh, and we tried to trademark this, but we couldn't. Trademarking food is very difficult. Uh, but we, I am the inventor of the cheesecake pop and the cake pop, although it's hard to patent and trademark those type of things. So it's funny that I walked past a booth today that has that same tree now and some cake pops from... Uh, so we're flattered that we've been copied. And, uh, but in food, it's very difficult. If you take McNuggets, chicken nuggets that are deep fried, you, McDonald's has a patent on McNuggets. Burger King does the same thing, calls it something else. So food, it, food is very difficult, uh, especially with something that pre-exists, like pastrami salmon. Pastrami is a technique, salmon exists, so you, you can trademark... Gourmet Pops, which is what we, we finally got a trademark on, David Burke's Gourmet Pop, but you can't prevent anybody else from making things that existed already. So, <clears throat> Well, Chef Burke, we thank you very much for inventing Cake Pops there you go. and for being here today, ladies and There's gentlemen. Cake pops. Thank you. Chef David Burke. Chef Burke will be signing his book in our book signing nook over there momentarily, ladies and gentlemen. If you want to line up, say hello, get an autograph, we will be happy to accommodate you.